everything that we've seen so far has all been about you sending data to the user. And that works in most cases. However, sometimes you need to get data from a user. And there's lots and lots of different examples why we'd want to do that. It could be as simple as a contact form where you're trying to get information from a user to get information that way. It could be from, oh, let's say a social media site. You need to have an ability to post something online, whether it's a comment or an original posting. Maybe it's an e-commerce site and you need to find out what a person's trying to order and they can select an item and they can select some descriptions about it and those types of things. So each one of those is different ways that we need to use something called a form. And a form is just a way to collect information from the end user and then have it sent to our server. And that's a big and a very important thing that we have to look at. By default, forms need a server in order to collect that information and then do something with it. The second thing that they're going to need is some sort of server side application some way that they can process all that information and then package it and put it into a way that your website and the people who manage that website can deal with it. Now, we're not going to talk about server-side languages in this class. That's beyond the scope of it. So maybe if you're interested, you can take one of those classes or take the 385 course, which goes into that a lot more detail. However, what I'd like to do right now is look at how can we make a form for our web page. So let's take a look. Now I've got my template set up and this is just a template. So I'm going to come in here and do a file, save as, I'm going to say form.htm. So this way we have all of our styles set up and things like that. Inside of our main, we're going to have our form tag. And this is what we have to do. Any information that we want to send has to be put inside this form tag. Now you can have multiple forms on the same page. For example, up at the top of the page, you might have a search form and that's on every page. And then on some pages, you don't have another form, just that one search form. While other pages maybe has a contact form or maybe they have an e-commerce site that you're going to be getting information from the user about what products they want to buy and how they're going to pay for it. So different pages have different requirements. You may even have more than just those two forms. We're going to look at something simple though, just one single form. And so I have that here and I'm going to save this and I'm going to open up a browser just so you can see what it looks like real quick. So in loading up my form, you're going to notice that there is no real change here. It's all pretty much the exact same thing that you would expect. You might be going, okay, well, what's up with that? Why is it like this? Well, it's because we don't have anything inside of our form. Our form is just a container that's going to hold all the different elements where we're going to collect information from the user and give it back to the website. So all we have right now is a container. Now this container does have some required or highly recommended attributes. So let's take a look at that real quick and switch back to our editor inside my form tag. My first one's going to be action. And action is going to be, where am I going to send these form results? Now, if I leave my action blank, it's going to go back to the page that I'm using. So this may or may not be a good thing. In my case, I'm going to send it to access to learn.com forward slash form.php. This is just a real simple processor just to make sure what we have is working. Okay. So the action is where do we send things to? The second part that I'm going to have is going to be my method. This is how am I going to send data to my server? So there's two major ways I have. There are some other ones as well, but we're going to look at the two major ways. The first is post. So when we send something via post, what we're actually doing is we are sending it through the HTTP headers. That is some information that we don't see. It's hidden from the user and people just casually browsing around. It's encrypted if we're using HTTPS, the secure version of HTTP. And that allows us to hide things like maybe a credit card number or a social security number if you're filling out a job application or anything else that might be considered PII, personally identifiable information, the things that you want to keep private about yourself. The second method is called get. 
and Git is actually sent as part of the address. So if you've ever gone to Google and said, Google, you type something in, you'll notice there's a little question mark there and it's got some other information behind it. And inside of that other information is actually what you searched for. Well, that allows you to share that search query with someone else. And that is exactly what Git is. It puts your search query up into the address bar. It makes it easy to share with other people, which may or may not be a good thing. If you're putting your password in a form, you probably don't want to do that because you don't want someone looking over your shoulder going, oh, that's your password? Kitty cat 1234? Really? So you want to be careful with what type of data you're sending. And depending upon what it is, your method will either be post or get. Now, there is a third one, which is called dialogue. That one's not used as much. You can read up on that if you would like. We're going to use post in this case. If I were to go back to my web browser, you're not going to see any changes in here whatsoever. So we're just going to keep moving. So let's take a look at the things that we're most likely to see inside of our form. And then we'll, so I'm going to put in here a paragraph tag. And inside my paragraph tag, I'm going to have a label. I'm going to say for name. I might say, well, why am I doing this? Well, let me show you real quick. I'm going to say, your name inside of this two label tags. What that's going to do is it's going to allow me to describe or show something to my user. Now, how does this relate? What's that for attribute about? Well, when I create an input, I'm going to do a couple things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define an ID. This ID is going to relate to the for in my label. I'm going to give it a name. This is going to be the name that's associated when I send it to the server. And then I'm going to specify type, in this case, text. The input tag is the most common tag that you're going to see on any website form because it's very, very versatile. That type allows you to change between a lot of different types of form fields. And we're going to see that in just a minute. For right now, we just have this information. And create one more paragraph tag. I'm going to specify button type is going to be submit. Now inside my open and closing button tags, I'm going to say send this form. What I put inside of here really doesn't matter. Okay. It can be anything I want. Some people will say submit. Some people will say contact us. Some people will want to say order or buy now or whatever the appropriate thing is. So this gives us a lot of flexibility with what our button's going to say. Come back here to my page, reload. You can see my form now, and you can see your name and a submit this form. What's interesting about this label is that if I click on your name, notice that the text box for it gets the focus. What does that mean? Well, it means that the text box gets the focus. So if I start typing, notice that I'm typing inside of my box. That's a nice little feature of the label. The label also has an even more important usage, and that is for accessibility. You see, when we use that for attribute, we tied the label to that text box, which means that if we have a screen reader because someone is visually impaired or otherwise impaired, it now knows that that label goes with that text box. And so it can provide an auditory clue when it's reading the screen back to the user. So there's very important reasons we want to use a label and probably that for attribute. There is another way that we can use a label and we'll see that in a little bit, but we probably want to use that for attribute. We definitely want to use a label because it makes it much more accessible to everyone involved in the web page. When I click send this form, you notice that it goes to my information. The key gets the user's name. Now I've gone in and kind of done some work to make it a nice key as well. So you can see what it is and you can see the value here. So it just makes it a little bit easier for people to see. Is it required? No, not by any stretch of imagination, but this just lets us see what we have. I always like to test my forms to make sure I'm seeing the right information. With modern browsers, there's other ways of doing this by looking at the side of network packets and stuff, but this is a really simple, easy way. Let me go back to this real quick. 
So we've seen the form tag and three very common tags that we're going to have. We've seen the label, the input, and the button. In between my button and my label, I'm going to create one more tag. We're going to create another paragraph tag, label for cust ID. Now you see I've gone in and kind of organized this one. Some people like this just because it's a little bit more organized, a little bit easier to see. And I'm going to create another input. I'm still going to use my ID. Notice that your name and your ID can be the same. They don't have to be, but they can be. And I'm going to specify this type as a password. Now you might be thinking, well, why would I put a password here? Well, maybe my customer name is a private value. We don't want it shown. So I'm going to come over here, reload this. And let's say my customer number is 1234. Notice it's hidden. So I don't have to use password just for storing passwords. All it does is anytime I type a character, it's going to show a little dot inside of there instead. So if I'm putting in my social security number because I'm doing an online job application, or if I'm doing a customer number, which is supposed to be private information or a insurance number or a password. Anytime I have that type of private information, I'm going to use type password to help secure my data from someone who might just be looking over the shoulder. Doing something we sometimes refer to as shoulder surfing. We don't want that. We want to protect our end users. And this is a great way to do that. So that's just another type that the input has. Let's look at some of these others that we're going to find. Now, some of them are pretty rare. You're not going to see them real often, but some of them you're, you're going to see quite often. And since it's a date type, notice that there is actually a date type that we can pick. You can also pick date time and date time locale. So it depends upon what you're trying to do. Date is going to give you the actual date. Now this used to require lots of JavaScript and a lot of times people just import an external library because that was a whole lot easier. Some people still want to because if you look at this, this is a kind of boring menu. And if you want a nicer looking calendar, maybe you'll go to that third party and download that special date field. But for something that's just really functional, that actually works really, really well. And so I can come in here and say, okay, here's the date that I want, October 5th, 2022. And I can click on this again and I can, of course, change this however I want. If I send this form, notice you can see the information. Now there's a couple of pieces of information you need to notice. For example, my value is sent. It is sent inside a header, so you can't look over the shoulder and see it, but that data is still sent. That's important to note. But the end processor has to have it. You also notice that the date is sent year, month, day, which may not be what you consider standard, but it's actually a really good format. It allows you to easily organize things and sort it alphabetically. It's also compatible with other programming languages that you might find on the server side. So yes, it may not be what you expect, but it still works. And on the server side, you can convert that around if you need to. In addition to date, you're going to notice there's a lot of other types that you can pick. Just real quick, we're going to run through some of these. For example, you can pick a color and it brings up a little color swatch that you can pick up from. Hidden means that it's something that's not seen. And sometimes you're going to be pulling in information from a previous form. It's a multi-stage process and you just send all the information from step one to step two and you just have all those hidden fields. That's acceptable. That's a way of doing it. Image is rarely seen. You used to be able to put an image that you can display and it can work like a button. You just don't see that very much anymore. Number is something you do see, and it will give you what they sometimes call a little switcher uh, that lets you click up and down to pick a number, and it's going to limit you to only numbers. The nice thing about numbers is you can actually set a minimum and maximum as well. So you can say, hey, pick a number between 1 and 10. So if you're trying to say, hey, how is our service? Rate us on a scale of 1 to 5. 
you can do that. Or what would you rate this movie on a scale of one to 10? Oh, it's a good eight or a good nine, you know, something like that. You get some information in there. We've already seen password and some others like text. So you can see a variety of different things that you might expect. Now there is a couple that we didn't see. For example, the checkbox. So let's take a look at that. Now for a checkbox, I'm gonna use a label just a little bit differently. And specify label, and I'm not gonna use the four, but inside of it, I'm gonna put my box and then my text. So I'm gonna say input type checkbox name shipping delay. Once again, I'm going to do another checkbox, name, packaging. Outside my input, I'm going to put packaging as well. Now, how a checkbox works is if it's checked, it sends a value. If it's not checked, it sends nothing. And so I have to put in a value attribute. Sometimes it'll be simply yes. Sometimes it'll be shipping delay. Sometimes it'll be something longer. It really just doesn't matter. Uh, let me give you an example of a smaller one where I just say yes. And what this does is if I come back here to my window for my browser, notice that it puts a checkbox and then I have the text for label after it. The whole thing is contained actually within the label. And if I click on shipping delay, notice it checks the checkbox. Click on it again it unchecks it. This is known as a Boolean value. I'm either checked or I'm unchecked. So if I click on shipping delay and send this form, you notice the shipping delay has a value here. My text boxes have been sent, but there's no value because I didn't put anything in them. But notice that my packaging was not sent. It's because it didn't have the checkbox associated with it. So that's a real important thing to kind of keep track of when I'm working with the checkbox. Now there's something similar to that, which is the radio button. Let's look at that real quick. So a lot of times we're gonna have some sort of little preference that's gonna give us just a little bit extra information because with a radio button, any one of that group can be selected. So what that means is I'm gonna once again have my label and I'm going to say input type radio, and then I'm going to give it a name, size, value, and I'm going to say large. Then outside of my input, but inside of my label, I'm going to specify large. Come down, I'm going to do this again, label, input type radio, name, size. Now you might go, well, wait a second, you have a previous radio about the name size. And that's correct. Everything that's inside that group, which there can only be one selected from, everything inside that group has to have the same name. Okay. Reload this. Notice I have my three different values. And if I click on large, then click on medium. Notice that large is no longer selected. If I click on small, medium isn't selected. If I click back on medium, small is no longer collected. So because the name was all the same for all three of those radio buttons, and it doesn't matter where these radio buttons were, typically we're gonna put them in the same area, but we don't have to. Because they all had the exact same name, it only lets one of them from that whole set be selected. And so if I have something where I only need, you know, like pick a color or pick a size or pick an engine style or a trim style if I'm picking a car, or maybe a, a clothing size if I'm doing clothing shopping, I can't have something that's both a small and a medium. I've got to pick the right size. This is a great way of handling it, especially if I typically have three, four, maybe five options. 
So check boxes allow for yes, no type of questions. Radio buttons allow for selections amongst a smaller group. Now you might think, well, can I A, have a pre-selected value? Yes, there's a selected Boolean attribute that you can pick. And then B, you might be asking, what happens if I've got like 10 options or maybe 50, like what state are you from? Well, that's where we use a different tag. So let's look at that real quick. So once again, I'm gonna set up label. It's gonna be for my state. Just gonna group and organize that a little bit better. And now I'm gonna use a select statement. With my select, I once again, I'm gonna have an ID and a name. And then a closing select. Inside of my select, I'm gonna have options. The options, the most common tag that you're gonna see. And so I might pick Tennessee. If I select Tennessee, it's going to send Tennessee as the value. On the other hand, I can also say option and give it a value attribute and say maybe FL, short for Florida. Now, if they pick Florida, it says, oh, you get a value. Let's pick that and then we'll send that. So if there is no value, it uses what's in between my two options tags if there is a value, it uses that instead. Now, another thing I can do is I can set a default selected value. So once again, I can just say selected and give it a different value. Now, even though this is the last one, when I come back to my browser, reload, notice that North Carolina is selected by default. If I take out the selected, come back, reload, notice that Tennessee is my default. So by default, it's gonna pick the very first item in my list. If there's an option that is selected, it will choose that one. If not, it's gonna choose the top one. And so that's how I use a drop-down menu. Now, I could also show multiple items. In my select, I'm gonna add a new attribute, size, and I can give it a number. This is how many rows do I want to display. Notice that even though I only have three options, it still shows five rows high. The nice thing about when I have more than one row selected is I can come in here and add one more attribute, multiple. This is a Boolean attribute that allows me to select multiple values. So I can choose North Carolina, and Tennessee, simply by holding my control on a PC or command on a Mac. This is commonly found maybe in like a job application site where you're saying, what cities you wanna search for? Or what states are you interested in? Or what job titles do you want? And it gives you a huge list and you can pick two, three, four, five options. This is how they do it. It's through a select tag with a size set and multiple as a Boolean value set. So there's one more common tag that you're going to see. And we're going to talk about what was the issue that was set up. And so we're going to come back in here and we're going to add one more text. This is going to be the big text box. So we're going to say it's for the comments. And in this case, we're going to do a text area. Notice that just like with our others, we have to have both the ID and the name. And like the select, our text area has a closing tag. And if I come back here and set this up, and reload this, you'll see here I can put in multi-line text. Now, in older versions of HTML, we could specify how many rows and columns we wanted as attributes of the text area. Now, we do this all through CSS. So let's go back to our editor. Look at our CSS, and I'm gonna create a section for my forms. So I'm gonna say text area, input, select, and label. 
Notice I put commas in between each of these. This means that these are separate selectors. So I have multiple selectors. We're all going to get the same rule just real easily. What rule is it going to be? Well, I'm going to set my font family. This is important because for some reason by default, my text area and my input are different fonts. Never understood that. We'll set the font size to be 16 pixels. So it's kind of easy and even as far as that goes. Now I can come in here and say label, start specifying things that are different. Like for example, I want my label to be bold. Why? Well, it makes it a little bit easier to see, makes it stand out. The next thing I want to set is the size of my text area. So I'm going to say text area. Now, instead of specifying a height and a width, a lot of times I'll specify a minimum and maybe a maximum. So I'll say something like min height and I'll say it's 100 pixels. And then I'll say min width, 75%. Maybe I'll specify it's 100%. You know, it just kind of depends upon what the value is I'm looking at. You can see in here that at the 75%, it took all the space it needed to. It still has room for please leave your comments to the left hand side. If I change that, it may shift down. So if I come over here and say, for example, instead of saying min width, I just say width is going to be 100% and come back here, reload. Notice that now my box for my text area is underneath that label. If I click on a label, it still goes into my text box. I can still type in things, but it's just about how it's going to space it. So these are things you have to be very conscious of when you're setting up a form inside of a web page. Remember that you can control anything you want. And a lot of times you'll see people using extra divs and spans. Or if you look at something like a bootstrap as a framework, you'll see how they organize things so that you can line things up a little bit better and easier. Is that working for you? That's something you have to think about for yourself. Does that work for you and what you're trying to do? In our case, this is very simple. It's just showing you how we're going to make all of our labels, text boxes, all that's the same fonts font size, font family, etc., and how to size some of those elements. How you choose to apply that is going to be based upon the design decisions that you're making for your website.